It's nearly time to drop the gavel here for the 2024 legislative session. Um, what can Minnesotans expect from the DFL controlled house to focus on this year? Well, we'll continue as we did last year, focusing on the things that they care about the most, which is uh, strong public education, affordable health care, and then economic security for their families. But this year, what that really means is investing in the state's infrastructure. So the state's borrowing bill will be the biggest order of business in 2024, looking at uh, taking care of the University of Minnesota assets, the Minnesota State Colleges and Universities assets, but um, important things like our wastewater infrastructure. So like when you flush the toilet, it goes down and the uh, uh, water gets where it's supposed to be, stormwater system, local roads and bridges. So those will be our focuses this year. Um, some inquiring minds I've talked to want to know, will the legislature complete its work before May 20th? It could be. We had a very active 2023. We did more in 2023 than I can remember ever doing in my 20 years of being here. And so I would think that if we can get a good bipartisan agreement with Republicans, it's possible the legislature could end early. Somehow people always find things to do to keep us here till the end. Um, but fingers crossed, maybe this year will be different. Let's talk about the latest budget forecast. I know we have one coming up here not too, too long. Um, the latest one, though, $2.4 billion surplus. But looking ahead, MMB officials said there could be a similarly sized structural imbalance in the next biennium. How does that play into any plans for this session? Well, when we think about the, 24, uh, the 2023 and 2024 sessions, that gigantic one-time surplus in 2023 is kind of like an outsized um, impact on the state budget. It's like a snake eating a hedgehog. Well, for a while, the snake doesn't eat, right? Or, or an alligator eating a deer. You know, that's how um, reptiles work, right? But in the state government, similarly, we, we invested in the people of Minnesota in terms of giving them $4 billion in tax cuts, huge investments in roads and bridges, higher education, uh, E12. But then in the years in the future, there's not that same kind of surplus. It's not year after year after year. And so we have to spend less in the future. And that's why um, it will take a while for all that spending that we did in 2023 to get out into our public schools and universities and um, to have an impact on the housing market, for example. So then we'll see what we need in the future. But the state budget is balanced. The revenues are increasing in the years in the future. And the cost of spending is decreasing in the years in the future compared to this current two-year period. Governor Walls released a capital investment proposal, I guess, a plan, um, right around a billion dollars. What do you think makes sense uh, in terms of the size of a capital investment package? I think he uh, was proposing a little bit more spending than the legislature might want to do. We will certainly work with the governor. We want a bill that he feels good about and that the Minnesota Senate feels good about. But I think given that we made a $2.6 billion investment last year in the state's infrastructure, we might be closer to $830 million this year. Republicans complained a little bit about being left out of negotiations in 2023. Um, you'll need some of their votes for a bonding bill to pass. Do you think that's going to be a problem, or do you, do you feel that the bipartisanship will be there? We worked really hard to get bipartisan support for things that we worked on. We had really a large number of bills that were strongly supported by both parties. But there's some issues where parties in the United States have just gotten so far apart. We used to have pro-choice Republicans um, and there's not any pro-choice Republicans anymore. So it didn't surprise me that they didn't want to participate in our, our work on reproductive freedom. We used to have Republicans who were stronger on anti-discrimination and making sure that no matter uh, what a person looks like, where they're from, or, or who they love, we treat them all the same way. So it didn't surprise me that we didn't have Republican support for our bills on, on equal rights. Um, but I, th I think on the bonding bill, we really, we got there. You know, negotiations between Democrats and Republicans are never easy, but we had a great agreement between Leader Damoth, Leader Johnson, Leader Dietzik, and myself. Just a couple of quick hitters here. Uh, school resource officers, kind of a hot button issue over the interim, uh, over some of the concerns and some 2023 legislation. Is that going to be addressed? It will, very early in the session. You know, there was a law that was passed in 2015 that said basically school administrators, teachers couldn't 
um, disproportionately uh, discipline students with disabilities for not following rules and abiding by classroom expectations. And in 2023, we try to expand that to all students because a, a student's IEP doesn't show when they're walking down the hallway. We want to make sure all students were appropriately disciplined. Well, in, in an effort to be inclusive, the Department of Education uh, wrote school resource officers into the law, which kind of brushed over that there's a real big difference between your average school employee and a police officer who works in a school. And police officers have a different responsibility. Our peace officers have very clear statutory regulatory regime that, that um, governs their conduct of what's in bounds and what's out of bounds. And so we'll make clear that peace officers are peace officers and the laws that govern peace officers apply to peace officers. At the same time, we're gonna take a look at what does it mean to be a school resource officer? There, should there be a common definition across the state? Right now there isn't. Should be, there be some expectations for training? So if a police officer opts to work in the public schools, is there some sort of specialized training we wanna make sure that they have before they go in that environment? And I expect that that bill will have bipartisan support and I expect that it will move quickly. Is there an appetite for sports betting this year? Some people have an appetite for sports betting. Um, you know, I think that's one of those things that's a nice to have, not a need to have. I think Minnesota's legislators are like Minnesotans themselves. They have divided opinions on it. Some people don't like gambling. They don't partake in it. Some people don't even approve of gambling and they don't want other people to gamble. Uh, same is true of the legislators who are here. There will be Republican votes in favor and opposed, Democratic votes in favor and opposed, and we'll just see if there's a package that they can put together that there's enough Republicans and enough Democrats to get a bill to the governor's desk. And I'm sure you know, uh, during the summer at the State Fair, we have uh, an opinion poll. It's an unofficial opinion poll, but I wanted to... Uh put this by you, um, our poll this year showed 73% of over the 8,000 poll takers think terminally ill patients should have the right to request medical assistance to end their lives if they choose to do so. Representative Freiberg has, uh, we're sponsoring a proposal that would allow that. Will it make it to the floor? Well, it's, I'm glad you brought up that issue because people always think that um, the parties draft that poll. And it's good yeah. to bring up the issue that House Public Information yeah. drafts the poll and it's a totally internal process. The Democrats and the Republicans don't really weigh in on that. Um, so with regard to the poll at the State Fair, it is in the education building. So there's a certain self-selected group of people, who some, some of whom might come to take the poll. Um, that being said, I think there is a lot of support for the medical aid and dying bill. I don't know if there's enough support for that bill to become a law this year. I think um, that's one of those issues that there's an evolving public ethos on it. In the past, people were like, no, that should never be the law. But increasingly, you're seeing more and more people uh, wanting those options for themselves. So uh, I don't think it'll probably get to the governor's desk this year, but I think we will have a lot of conversation about it. And just finally, uh, we're saying goodbye to some of the heavy hitters here. Uh, yeah. Representative Pulowski, Representative Liz Olson, Representative Garofalo, and Representative Doubt's not going to be here anymore either. Um, do you have any, I guess, uh, thoughts on that or parting words for, for some of the people that we're going to be saying goodbye to? Well, I think the average uh, number of retirements in a year is about 18 members, and we're around 13, 14 right now, so I expect there'll be more retirements and I'm sure more surprises. But even though you see uh, a lot of disagreement between Republicans and Democrats here, we do get along pretty well. So I know uh, Representative Doubt and I tangled on the floor, but like interpersonally, we have a really good relationship. and. A lot of the people who come here and are particularly colorful add to the ambiance. We'll miss uh, Representative Pat Garofalo. He's definitely a colorful personality. And then there's the people who are not show horses, they're work horses. They just put their heads down and they get things done that improve people's lives. Liz Olson, um, the work that she did on uh, helping folks with substance use disorder, uh, particularly in the opioid space, um, will help Minnesotans for decades to come. So we'll really miss her. And then Gene Pulowski, you know, uh, I think there's been generations of lawmakers who believe he just came with the furniture. He was just always here, always going to be here. 
and he's really served the state well. Um, to go out on top with this North Star Promise, uh, making college free for students whose families make $80,000 a year or less, is a really nice high point for him to end his service on. All right, Speaker Hortman, thank you very much. Thanks for being here.